Now, does that one come with the photos? This one is not for sale. Oh, okay. Isn't that a great photo? Yeah. The black and white one. No gloves, ink and blood. When did you start wearing gloves? Uh, I kept thinking I should be wearing gloves. And one day, uh, a girl who was working for Ed came up, and she looked in my little room, and I had customers outside. And she looks in, she says aloud, no gloves. I sent Fred out for a box of gloves. <laughs> People would come into the shop with um, a preconceived notion. For example, a lot of the uh, Hispanic men wanted um, Jesus Christ or the Madonna, and Tom felt like tattooing something Japanese. And he would invariably talk them into, instead of Christ, a Japanese demon head. Or instead of Madonna, a woman that looked like a hooker. I met Tom in about 73, 74. And I went into this um, apartment around uh, Washington Square Park. Ed was tattooing a Kieran on the back of Tom's thigh. And I was just blown away. I never saw anybody like Tom. Here's a man with a whole body suit, practically. And I thought, I, I'm gonna have to photograph this guy. He's so interesting. And I said, can I have your phone number? And he said, yes, it's H-E-V-T, and they were all letters. He didn't think in terms of numbers. I felt that Tom was not acting strange. I felt that's truly who he was, that he was somewhat primitive, that he's lived in sort of an isolated way and wasn't part of the mainstream and didn't care about that. One of the entertainment qualities to hanging around the shop was you never knew what was going to happen. There was a, a character that showed up with a peace pipe claiming to be an American Indian, although I think he was a Latino. Th there were just so many different characters there that uh, it was like going to a Fellini movie every time you went there. Tom had the weirdest assortment of people around there. His crew was just very eccentric, like New York street life. It's like when you read Burroughs, you know, and the stories when people like Hunky and then some of those guys around, you know, rolling lushes in Times Square. And I mean, it's just that complete old school New York, you know, underworld, underworld. It was a diversity of customers. Later on, he had uh, Chinese gang members coming to him. Customers would be coming in and out all day, all the times I was there and they would usually call from a payphone, say they were in the area, and then usually if Fred Clausen was there, he would go down the three flights to answer the door. Fred Clausen was a friend of Tom's, and he was there almost all of the time. He drew a, a lot of the flash that Tom had. He, he was a um, pretty good artist. And that allowed Tom time to just do the tattooing, you know. I remember he paid Freddie 30 bucks a day. That was his, because he would always say, I'm doing this one for Freddie. I do one a day for Fred. He was just like Tom's right hand guy and gopher and did a lot of stuff for him and drew some of the flash. And he was just around. I mean, it was like everything in DeVise. It was just really amorphous, you know. Malone used to say, I was the only tattooer with a butler. <laughs> That, that was free. He'd answer the door. You answer know. the door. He was very soft-spoken. And and, and, uh, and Binks sort of his first tattoo on Fred, which was my tattooing when he was a little kid. And he, that was the first tattoos he ever saw. Oh, because Binks lived near where Fred right. lived? Right. Yeah. He grew up in the town I grew up in, Point Pleasant, in New Jersey. I might have been 10 years old in the, in the supermarket with my mother and I saw this really dynamic person. He had this really long beard and tattoos all over his arms. So the first tattoos I really saw, the first you know, heavily tattooed person I saw were DeVita tattoos. You know, and later on I met Fred. You know, I got to see the tattoos that blew my mind when I was 10 years old. I got to see in person. So 
cool and so strong and so personal. I think he, Binks inherited all of Fred's stuff, all of his journals. Oh yeah, he used to write journals. Freddie kept journals, I guess piles of them. And then he died, and Binks and how he gave them all to Binks before he died. Before he passed away, he left me his whole collection of journals. So there, there's actually hundreds of them, which pretty much span the course of 1966 to about 1994. It's just cool to like really like get a you know a guy that I knew pretty well, but to really see where he was at when he was my age and younger, it, it's really cool and it's weird that you know we were kind of these kindred spirits and. and it's strange, you know, I go through here, this, a lot of these notebooks could have been mine, you know, reading some of the writings and some of the stuff that he collected. Okay, here's a good Fred one I, I could read. I look up to no man in adoration as I did before. Now I know I am as strong or stronger than my past gods. I meet them as equals, or it makes no difference if I don't meet them at all. I have my own contentment to keep me company. The world opens up in front of me without any effort on my part. They're really, really a great insight onto Freddie's personality and also the time that they were like hanging out in New York, Tom and Fred were hanging out in New York. I don't think that they were necessarily part of like a scene, but they, they were kind of the scene. And the whole like Eastern, uh, like Buddhism thing that was kind of catching on in New York City at the time, they were there for that. You know, you talked to Tom about it, and he, I don't think he was as into it as Freddie was. But, uh, you know, I think that it was more Tom was friends with Tyler and also his neighbor. Tyler was an anarchist that had started kind of his own church down in the Lower East Side. He would do tattoos according to the phases of the moon and certain lunar holidays. He was definitely a far out character. You know, my friend Vale did an interview with him in one of those tattoo times. I mean, he had this whole, this phalanstery thing, and it was based on a combination of mainly, you know, esoteric Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana stuff, and uh, astrology and all that. And he, you know, he did these insane things. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal person, really just out there, you know, r really brilliant, a real genius. When you became a member of the Iranian phalanstery, you went downstairs, Dick took your, your photograph of the Polaroid. He wrote your name on it backwards. In other words, I was Ken Hushbub. And uh, then he tacked it on the wall in the uh, Fallon Street, you know, which was an old synagogue. Talk about it. bizarre. This Reverend Dick did this. This is a mantra. That's on Monty Podme Hum. This is from a gravestone, a Tibetan gravestone. And then the rest of these things are Davidas. This all this stuff, all these tribal things he put on in the early 70s. I'm the first to do the, the uh, heavy, what they call tribal. The tribal, yeah. I'm the first to do that. This thing here he found on a, it was a carving on a stone that he found on the raw, on the ground somewhere. And he brought it home and he made an ink he rubbed it with ink and pressed it on a piece of paper and he got this design out of it, this geometrical design here. And then he tattooed it on there. He did a great thing, he put on a lot of uh, elbows that was off some kind of yeah. thing on the street. And he, it was just, it's like, well, that's a good design. You know, that's a good design. And, and it was so important. I mean, that's why in, in a lot of ways, like I say, when I went in his place, it was the first time it really lit my head up because I got so deep into tattooing and it took a long time to break it through and go, well, these other things could be great tattoos too. And Davida was like, you know, the past master of that stuff. It was mainly uh, like Zuni things, rainbow designs and stuff. It, like black graphic designs, which really, you know, Cliff was on that big um, and really realized how great it could look. He was a better salesman than I was. But people could argue that you were the first person to do tribal tattooing in the United States. Yeah, but if they would have asked me 10, 20 years ago, I would have said it was Cliff. But Cliff would have said it was you. But Cliff said it was me, and I believe him. And that's Pueblo Indian design. Was that on somebody's arm? Right.
this design? Uh, yes, you looked at my work. Have a lot, a lot. It can't be a lot because I, I'm not in that many magazines. Yes. He was one of the first American tattoo artists to do large-scale tribal work at all. It was like him and Cliff Raven, some of the first, and he was doing those big rainbird patterns that you can see in that article. I'd seen him in the uh, White Tattoo Town, the Art from the Heart issue. In the article, Ed made a point of really focusing on how Tom's shop and his environment that he created was really an organic part of New York. The Lower East Side at the time was this, obviously a super dense sensory overload kind of place with graffiti and all sorts of people hanging out and stuff going on and how his, his shop was kind of a nexus for all these forces, social forces that were in New York and sort of congregated there and met in this weird kind of somewhat surreal environment that Tom had created that could kind of contain it and let it flow through. Absolutely, you know, he was blown away by uh, the fact that Tom had like filtered, you know, his own life experience through these tattoo designs in a sense and turned them into like a whole different vision, you know, he was like a visionary. But people generally did not come by, I don't think until much later, they didn't start to appreciate what he had done and what he was doing until much, much later. I mean, years and years later, you know. He never traveled much. He stayed, Tom stayed put pretty much. Occasionally he would go out to California to visit Ed. You know, occasionally he would go to Hawaii. I mean, you can count them on three fingers. But then later on in life, he started going to the conventions, you know, like pretty much after he retired from tattooing, that's when he started going to these places because then, you know, he, he would go and sell his artwork is what he was doing when he wasn't tattooing anymore, you know, he needed to make an income somehow and that's how he was. And he would do a little bit of tattooing, you know, but he had gotten married and Jenny took a job with IBM. So they uprooted everything. And he figured he would just open up a tattoo shop there. In fact, he did open up a tattoo shop. And he opened up a shop in Newburgh, I think, when he was 60 years old. But then nobody knew where the hell he was anymore, you know what I mean? And, but he, there was no business, you know, to support the shop. He couldn't do it. I said, you're opening up a tattoo shop. You're 60 years old. He said, yeah, and I'm coming back again when I'm 80. I remember him saying that. Oh, well, show these guys some of my new flesh. Yeah. Want to see some of his new stuff? Yeah, I'd love to. Black, my black flash. This is rubbing from a tattoo stencil. And this is meant to be put on a chest this way. I love the new black paintings that he's doing. Yeah. You know, the black paintings with the colored drawings, the colored rubbings and stuff like that. Boy, they're just super. Really beautiful stuff. Yeah, it's beauty. And, and all, all the outline is, is rubbing, and then it's filled in. He takes the filler out of uh, those notebooks, you know, like the black piece of paper, so you can put a piece of art on both sides of it. He takes that piece of paper out, it's kind of thin black, and that's the thinness he needs to get a, a good rubbing off of it, you know. He wanted me to send me all the fillers out of all my notebooks. I said, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Forget about it. Well, I call these the creative rubbings. Creative rubbings? Yeah, from, oh, from tattoo stencil. Oh. So when you first started making rubbings, Tom, was it from like sharing out when people would share designs with you? or yes. Before copy machines or anything like that? I was getting rubbings of all his acetate stencils. That's he saw when I was doing that. He saw that and he did a, a rubbing. He added, a, I think it was either a Virgin Mary or a Jesus. He added a koi, just rubbed the koi right on top, and that's when the stencil rubbing thing started. And so then he started doing a lot of that on paper, and he showed it to Nick and Ed, and then they were like, "Oh wow!" I think Ed said, "You know, there it was. It was in front of our faces all these years," and he just. He brought it out, like, this, you could do that, make these crazy things with the stencils, you know. That's the beauty of Tom DeVita, is that 
he doesn't change. He's doing what he does. As, you know, he's making DeVito artwork every day. And the trends come and go, and he's still doing what he does. He's kind of like, I, I, I don't want to offend him, because I know his, his religious beliefs, but he's like the Buddha of tattooing to me, you know, like it, it's, he's just there doing his thing every day with it, you know, not affected. Oh, yeah, a lot of artwork. Some days I don't do anything. Some room is get out of hand. Yeah. And I work every day, I'm always working. And so I've got 40 years of work behind me with no outlet. Yeah. So it looks like I've just recently done it because I keep repeating myself. The tattooers, they're into prints. They think prints are, are the thing. A lot, of people, a lot of people are like that. I got them fooled with prints. Not only tattooers, but all the galleries. They sell prints. When I do sell a print, if, if it's a print, I work on it, on top of it, disregard that the print is there. It's what I do that's important. Yeah. In terms of the art, I mean, no, none of us were, you know, none of us were selling any art. None of us were doing, we were just all tattooing, you know. And of course, I was totally open to the idea of it because I came out of a, you know, fine art background, but uh, then when we put that show together in Chicago, that I Tattooed America, I thought that would really do it. The show got a lot of attention, the show traveled. And it was a show of primarily tattoo artists who are also fine artists. So I don't know how many people were in the show, like 30 people maybe or something like that. It was quite a few people. It was one of the big first big art shows of, of tattoo art. At that time, even if you weren't very selective, finding tattooers who were going to do some art to be in a gallery show would have been difficult. Plum had a hell of a, um, a show. In the I Tattooed America show, I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was like this giant wall of grape crates Latin. I mean, he sent 300 pieces. He sent like his whole shop. I mean, the shop is like this organic part of his aesthetic, you know, or his house. I mean, what is less like DeVita's aesthetic than a piece of art floating symmetrically in a white space? I mean, that's, that's the opposite of what he does, you know. So, I mean, obviously, he stole the show, you know. It was a really beautiful show. Just his, his perceptions are so completely unique, and that's what all these years we've been trying to get the, the, the high art world to recognize him, and he's just so out there. And if people didn't understand the vocabulary of tattooing and the cultural context of tattooing, they just didn't know where to place it. They didn't know what to do with it, you know? I, I thought DeVita would make a big hit there. But these art people would come in and just, they just didn't get DeVita's stuff, you know? No, you know what? I never expect anything. I think by that point, I had already learned not to expect anything, you know? Yeah. It's one of my favorite pieces by Tom. The koi, the colors in it, the, the brush strokes, I think are just beautiful. But I've shown his work to painter friends and they're, they're astounded. They're saying, who is this guy? He's a genius. Look at these brush strokes. And you know, he's a, here's a guy that doesn't have an art education and is just um, going by intuition and it's genius. He, he's really underappreciated. He really should be shown in a major gallery. Did I show you these here? Yeah. These landscapes. These little vignettes. You want to see a hundred of them? Sure. <laughs> here, here, come, come here. Ah, oh, look at that. It's beautiful. Oh. Can you imagine how beautiful these would be if they were all on lined up like all in one, you know? Yeah. That's so I'm down this. The slope of the, uh, oh, the Guggenheim. The Guggenheim. Yeah, down the Guggenheim. Yeah. Yeah. One right after another. <laughs> no, I don't think he fits in, and I think that's probably what, why he should be recognized. Uh, I don't know what label that anybody could put on it, but it's very different than what uh, I've ever seen before. This is one of my boxes. 
The box is a fruit box oh, yeah. from, the oh. from, from the supermarket. Oh, I had this in the uh, in the library art show. In Newburgh or in, in Newburgh? I sure have been showing there for about ten years, and I won about uh, three or four ribbons. We all want to see him somewhere that he's, he gets the, the fame that we feel he deserves and the recognition and the appreciation, but I think he might be content uh, the way it is. First of all, he's 80 years old. How much do you want an 80-year-old man to work and hustle and try and start at the bottom of the art game? I mean, that's absurd. He, he does it because that's what he does. I mean, he, he's, he's a true artist. I mean, he makes it if no one looks at it, you know? We, skip, we didn't get to the full uh, resume of his art shows because some of the art shows that he participates in have been at, the, I think it was called the Newburgh Arts Festival, where they have like, you know, the amateur art shows. And he would go and he would set up his little table and he would have exactly what you, you see in his house or whatever, these super interesting, rough, montage things and he would just sit there with the old lady who did the color by numbers painting and whatever he would just sit there. Show started already. Oh I wanted to count how many people come in so we had the girl next door come in. This is so cool. Yeah. So you're ready? Yes. To give your spiel? What spiel? The history of Tom. <laughs> to who? To everybody. <laughs> So this is you here doing yes, this? Yes, What is your name? DeVita. Steve, my name's no. Caroline. No, and you I'm... live in Newburgh? Yes, my name is DeVita. DeVita. De okay, what's your first name? Tom. Tom DeVita. I think people have been waiting for you to come down from the hill. I've been trying to get people to appreciate Tom for so long. And now it's like when people came, when those tattooers came in yesterday and were like, oh, just want to know and we really respect you and stuff. It just, it touched me and it was also like, where the fuck have you guys been? How you doing, Mr. Kavita? It's an honor to meet you. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. I've been wanting to uh, come and visit you for a while, so I was pretty excited. To... Where's your shopping mall? Um, right on Main Street, it's called Graceland Tattoo. Yeah, we pass by there sometimes. If I was walking, I would walk by the tattoo shop because I usually don't go into them. Yeah. Because nobody knows who I am. We do. <laughs> I doubt it. If no. I if I had walked in, you would have known who I was. Well, I would've. He would know. Well, I guess you you'd be surprised at how many of us know you and look up to you. I know I do. I just want Tom to be happy. And I don't think that like. I mean, I'm sure he'd be happy to have a museum show, but he's a very grounded guy. It would just be another event in, in his week if he had a museum show, I think. You know, I would like for people to keep his mind entertained a little bit. Six months later, they come back and want to tell me. <laughs> you know, I would like to see Tom engaged in, 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 the world, in the tattoo world as much as he would like to be and have people who respect him to talk to him and, you know, just give him some kind of integration into the world. There you go. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. This is taking longer than I thought. Your method is very slow, Tom. I thought it'd be one hour. I'm tired. You're tired? Put a it hasn't ghost, started yet. Ghost cat. You got nine hours. Here. Yeah. This one? Where are we going? Well, why you got to keep asking me? Just put them up. <laughs> because if, as soon as I do it under my own uh, direction, you're going to make me take it down and move it. He, he don't want to make any decisions. He knows, I think he knows the consequences. I'm not getting paid managerial salary. I'm just a day laborer. <laughs> <laughs>